percent of the vote back in November 2006, and I don't think that support's gone anywhere but up since then. Representing over 60 communities, or 60 communities and 11 district courts, he's a very, very busy man, including the juvenile court. Uh, Joe grew up in Worcester. This is sort of a big family here, Joe, where we can run out of food, and if you don't get there on time, sometimes you might not get any. So you experienced that today. And um, his father was also the congressman for, for the district for many, many years. Joe and his wife, Judy, uh, have five children and uh, committed to Worcester, and I believe we'll see Joe in Worcester in his position for a very, very long time. Let's have a hand for Joe Early. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Appreciate appreciate the invitation. It's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, thank you, Rotarius. Um, I was just caught by something Dave said when he was up here a second ago. As Ronnie mentioned, I've got five. We've got five children, and uh, mentioned how you, you have a forty-year-old son, forty-two-year-old son, and they just had babies. And the baby's two years old. Wow, that is waiting. But I've got a 17-year-old, real proud of my family. You know, you find out what you're down here for. But 17-year-old at Darty, a 16-year-old at Darty, 14-year-old at Darty, and a 12-year-old at Forest Grove. Two years ago, I got the surprise of my life. We got a one-year-old too. <laughs> we waited. You, you can't make it up. Uh, you can't make it up. But it's a blessing, and it's been a blessing. And you know. When I mentioned uh, Worcester being home, Worcester is home. Uh, well, first of all, Dave said I had a half an hour. I'm not taking a half an hour. I can remember an economics club speech at Mechanics Hall where by, former Vice President Dan Quayle got up and he started talking about uh, policy, dry policy, he got into it. And the more he got into it, the more people were falling asleep. The more he got into it, people were squirming in their seats saying, when is this going to end? I'm not going to leave here today and let my good friend Steve Abraham kick me in the rear end to anyone who's going to listen to how many people Joe Early put asleep the Rotarians. Um, so my modest goal is to keep everyone awake. I'm just finishing my eighth year in office. When this started, I had black hair. Uh, my blood pressure was a lot lower. I'm sure I was a lot healthier. I had no idea, no idea what it was what this job would entail. I had no idea that with 180 employees, it only takes one employee for you to lose sleep. And I had no idea about the crime that we were going to see. And uh, we've seen some cases that just boggle the mind. They really do. I can't say too much about it, but we're out in Blackstone last Thursday and Friday. Now to get out there and to walk into a situation where we think we might have one child that's died. One child. And when our investigators get into the house, they, they're immediately hit with bugs. They're immediately bugs that are hop. Everyone finished eating. They're bugs that are hopping, crawling, flying. So we, we didn't know what we had. There's rodents in there. There's rat droppings. We, we get the hazmat people. They came out, and, and to be extremely cautious, we went in with the suits. We had a picture of a dead child. We sent it to Dr. Niels at the medical examiner's office. And Dr. Niels, the question was, is it a child? Is it a doll? You know, some of these... Uh, uh, magazines they sell now, anyone who has kids or grandkids, they, they can make a doll eerily simi similar to a child. Um, he gave us the opinion it was a child, and he looked at it and he said, you know something, I'm going to come out. I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Niels for coming out. So as they got in there on the investigation, um, we thought we were dealing with one dead baby in a house that was just squalid. It, the squalor was unbelievable. It really was a filth pile a foot and a half high. And all the uncertainties and all of the things start coming at you. But then, when Robin from State Police Crime Scene Services came over and said, Joe, we got three. It was like all the wind got taken out of you. We got what? Robin, how many? We got three, Joe. The investigation ramps up. Now I'm being asked by a lot of good people, a lot of rational people. I'm asking, being asked a lot of rational questions to which I can't give rational answers to. I thought I'd seen it all until I saw this. I can't say too much about it, the investigations in its infancy. But is that the only peculiar case? No. But we've had a great run recently. I, I really am a firm believer I, in trying murder cases. I really believe in trying murder cases. If the evidence is there, let a jury make a decision. I don't want to knock anyone or my predecessor or anyone, 
But if you got the evidence there, let, let the jury make a decision. Put your put your case in front of the jury. Let the judge give the law, let the jury hear the facts and make a decision. We've tried about 15 murder cases over the last three years, resulting in 14 convictions. And some of the ones I'm most proud of is a kid I played Little League Baseball with, Kevin Hawkins, was killed. Kevin left SUNY's pub on Chandler Street, never to be seen again. 20 years later, we tried the case. We started putting it together. Danny Bennett, I got a great first assistant, started putting things together. Witnesses who didn't want to talk because they were fearful of the three guys. We still got one to go. Fearful of the three guys. Now that these guys, one's locked up, one's in me, now they're talking a little bit. We got a little bit aggressive. We started searching for other victims. Before you know it, we get two murder convictions. Two murder convictions. These guys will never see the light of day again without being behind bars. And I'm so proud of that. Shrewsbury case. Young man. Again, it, it boggles the mind. He killed his wife in front of two kids. His two kids. Two kids had to come in to testify. Two kids did an unbelievable job. I was so inspired by their courage. Uh, one of the kids wore a Boston Bruins jersey to the trial every day. And... Uh, he was doing a report on the Bruins. I got lucky enough to get to know one of the greatest human beings I've ever met, Bobby Orr, down the Cape, through my friend on the Cape and Islands, Michael Keefe. And after the kid testified, and uh, the daughter testified, I, I contacted Bobby, and he, and he sent up two pitches, personalized pitches for the kids, and, you know, they were really touched by it, but I was, I was touched by Bobby Orr's compassion. I was touched by their courage. And it ended up, you know, we gave the kids some closure. It ended up, we made the best out of a horrible situation. Recently, a Rutland man uh, was killed by uh, two people from Worcester. One guy is now put away for life. Drugs. Drugs was the motivating force. Drugs, money. Um, the impact that they have on a society is unbelievable. All right, enough of that. We also got a grand jury um, that we're using in a completely different way now. The grand jury used to sit two weeks a month. And basically, when I got in, I saw that the grand jury... Um, could get better. And my father always said to me, Joe, you can make things better. You can get better. And I was so touched by my father's public service, that's why I got into this job. Took a pay cut to do it, but I never got tired of someone saying to me, hey, Joe, did I ever tell you what your father did for my family? No. Your dad never told you? No. Well, my dad never told me anything about he did, or what he did in order to help people. You know, service before self, what you guys are all about. He did it and, and I said I didn't want to get to a point later in life where I hadn't taken a shot at public life or public service or given something back. So I ran for DA. When I got in, I saw that the grand jury was being used, for example, in a murder case. You'd have a police officer come in. And the police officer would read five reports. Now the problem with that is that say, if you had a serious murder or a serious case, the defendant could get two of these witnesses before trial. But if rather than have the police officer read the statements, you have the witnesses come in and read the statements, and especially a lot of these drug murders, the bad murders that are in lousy neighborhoods, I've got their testimony locked in. Now, under the intimidation of a witness statute, if they lie to us, it's a 10-year felony. If you lie in a murder case to the grand jury, it's potentially a life felony. So now this has some teeth. Now the grand jury, to me, has some teeth. We use the grand jury for investigative purposes. We had a little bit of, we had some facts about cases um, but we needed more. Bring in witnesses. Put them before the grand jury. They're all not crazy about it, but it's the only way I'm getting them down there. Sometimes we have to tell them, here's your subpoena. It's not an invitation, but we expect to see you down here. I ran on a theme of prevention. I really believe, you know, I was in law practice. Steve, Steve and I shared an office over Chestnut Street, and he could tell you, when kids came in the door, or families came in with their, with their children, you knew you still had a chance to modify behavior. You could get to kids, you know, whether it be uh, fire setters, shoplifters, kids who were starting to show some signs of domestic violence or controlling behaviors. You could get to these kids. What I did was I took the best and brightest attorneys in that office and put them in juvenile court. Prior to that, juvenile court didn't have the importance, and I don't know the reason why, but to me it was going to have the importance. It wasn't going to be a place for prosecutors who couldn't make it in district or superior court. It wasn't going to be a throwaway court. We put our best and breath, brightest prosecutors in district court so we could make a difference. So when we got in, it took six months, six months to get a jury trial in juvenile court. If you're dealing with a child, 
you know that justice has to be swift, it has to be quick, it has to be fair and compassionate. Well, I put in Donnie Zenos, brilliant guy in my office in charge of the juvenile court, the wait for a jury trial for that kid went from six months to three weeks. The kid's still listening. The kid's still tuned in to what they had done wrong. A kid's still willing to make changes. I'm so proud of that. We also made a point of not punishing kids that were making a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. No one's perfect. Drugs and alcohol play a big part in it. Now, we've roughly got about 12 colleges in the area. I can't remember the exact number since the billboard came down on 290. <laughs> but kids drink, and they make some bad decisions when they drink. And oftentimes, a police officer will arrest them, and he'll be charged with a minor transporting alcohol. What would happen in the past was they'd get to court, their mom or their dad would be with them, depending on a guardian, someone. They'd pay a fine of $200. The case would continue without a finding for six months. If they stayed out of trouble, the case would dismissed after six months. But the problem was that they now had a record. Every time they filled out a job application, every time they went to get a loan, every time they looked uh, to do something, they had to explain that stupidity, that mistake. So what we did was say, all right, I'm going to postpone your arraignment for 90 days. During the 90 days, you give me eight hours of community service. I'm going to have you work on the fields, the schools, the playgrounds of Worcester, Worcester County. You're going to give me eight hours of community service, and if you do, I'm going to have you take a one-hour online test about drugs and alcohol. If you take that and pass it, I'm going to dismiss your case prior to arraignment, prior to the new arraignment date. Now, the benefit is that parents don't send their kids to Worcester, Worcester colleges, Worcester County colleges to get a racket. They send them to get an education. But by doing this, by doing this, they've given something to the community that's hosting them. They're not getting a record, and their lights aren't altered forever. We put about 1,500 kids through the program. <coughs> we might have 35, 40 of them recidivists. I'm real proud of that. That's preventing crime. That's showing compassion. Now, another thing I'm real proud of is I take, when we make an arrest from a drug dealer, we take their money. Half goes to the police department where uh, the town or the city uh, where the arrest occurred, the other half goes to my office. I can do whatever I want with it. I could buy copiers with it, I can buy pens and pencils with it, or I can prevent crime. To me, preventing crime is just as important a component as my convictions. It really is. So we go over to Darden in South, which we've adopted. They had fields, uh, football fields, that were that high. The coach told us he couldn't wait for a frost. I said, what do you mean you can't wait for a frost? Well, Joe, when the ground freezes later in the afternoon, it thaws and it gets a little soft. We punch the fields, we loom the fields, we seed the fields. South, they didn't have a dime to put into the field, neither did Darby. We go down to O'Connell Field uh, over by the Grove Street Fire Station. We took seven tons, seven tons of rocks off of that field where kids were playing touch football. These are the, some of the things I'm proud of. I take the drug dealer's money, I break, have Diamond Turf Management come in and redo baseball fields. Um, whether it be they worked at Tom Ash, they worked at Darty, they worked at South, they put a new infield down for about $20,000 at Foley Stadium. It might seem like a lot, not until you compare it to the million and a half that St. John's put on at their field out in Shrewsbury. I have the commence, I have them pick up the geese droppings, I have them rake the leaves, I have them do the things with that eight hours of community service that's making our county a better place. And I'm proud of that. You keep a kid busy after school, you keep them around responsible adults, they're going to stay out of trouble. So we give money to the uh, soccer teams, let them buy new uniforms. We give money to uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Milford Youth Center. We give money to Fitchburg High School for new football uniforms so that these kids feel proud about playing for that team. These are things that I think, I can't think of a better way to spend drug dealers' money. We give it to South High where Mario Benenda has school with about 80% kids under the poverty level. We buy them volleyball uniforms, we buy them soccer uniforms, we buy them football helmets so they don't have to cut kids. This is what I'm proud of. Now, one other, and I'm almost done, one of the other things we do, and I'm real proud of, is we are getting into the schools. We are getting into the schools. You take all the kids that get into trouble, just the kids that get into trouble, that 100%, 80% are going to have one or two brushes with the law. Because it's going to be a parent, there's going to be a guardian, there's going to be a strong adult figure in that child's life that's going to help them get back on the straight and narrow. You take 5% of the 100 that get into trouble, no matter what you do, 
They're going to stay in the criminal justice system. They're going to cause you heartache. They're going to cause you anxiety. But they're going to be involved in the criminal justice system. Now, leaves you with 15%. 15% can go with the 5. They can go with the 80. But getting to these kids, getting to these kids, I think is the way we stop building jails. Getting to these kids is the way we see the numbers go down in the jails. Getting to these kids is how we have a safer community. So we talk to them. We, our community outreach team gets into the school. We talk about texting and driving. We talk about bullying. By the way, we, it's our number one requested program. We've talked to over 300,000 people since we put this together. I'm not in the paper because I'm a little bit like my father. I don't want any credit for it. it just it's give me something to talk about here. But it just lets you know how important the people in that office are. We talk about safe dating. You see the rash of domestic violence now in the NFL. They're playing catch up. We get into the schools and we tell a young girl, if you get 300 messages from a day, a day from your boyfriend or boy, it's not normal. It's controlling behavior. We get to the boy and tell him it's not normal. If that boy tells that young girl that if you go on vacation with your family for the week and leave me here, you don't love me, these are not normal behaviors. But when we get into the schools and talk to these kids, we talk to the parents as well. When we talk to everyone, I know we're helping to make life better. I know we're preventing crime. I know it's working. And these are the things I'm most proud of. You'll never really see them on the front page of the paper too much, but the prevention end of it, I can't think of a more important part of this job than the prevention. We deal with the murders and the serious crimes when they happen, but attacking at an early age, attacking aggressively, I know is where we're making a difference. So that's my speech, and I guess I'll take some questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes. One, one comment and one question. I know you're taking some criticism for using the seeds of drug money for sports programs. Yes. But I think uh, most people would agree that that's a very, very effective way to prevent uh, crime, both in the short term and on the long term basis. And I would hope that you can take the program. Tell you uh, two, two things on that. That article may have been the best article I ever got. Your, your comment, you're not alone with that. Uh, I wasn't building an addition to my house with the dog. I was, I was building a softball field at Dart. And my father, and I admire and respect my father so much, we miss him. He said to me before he died, uh, you know, he said to me, he goes, Joey, don't you ever let anyone talk you out of spending money on those kids. Don't you ever let anyone talk you out of doing that. And I'll never forget that. They can criticize. Someone wants to criticize me, go ahead. You, you, as he also told me, you get into the job, you got to expect criticism. But I'm, I'm so proud of that. Thank you. And, and it's not just sports. It's the arts. It's um, the Audubon Society. It's, it's so many different things. I'm, you keep kids busy, you're keeping them out of trouble. Secondly, when you talk about peculiar cases, why don't you talk about the guy who tried to steal a pizza from you? <laughs> it's not all about me. <laughs> that, Let me tell that story. Yeah. Uh, uh, if we have a minute, I'll tell it later. But uh, that was an interesting day. Yes. Uh, Joe, I, uh, by the way, I agree with uh, Tim on that use of money for sports. Uh, betterment. Uh, by the way, I know your father is playing basketball. You didn't mention that. That's what we need, Joe. Early first. Uh, yeah. Basketball at St. John's Hall of uh, I got a question. I've been reading a lot, very disturbing stuff about campus rape. Yes. You've got 12 colleges in the city, throughout the county, many more. Yep. How, do you, how do you react, uh, inter interface with campus authorities? Or, well, tell us about that, if you would. I, I'd be happy to. I got three daughters. We're going to be doing some more on that. I, I know uh, I supported Warren Tolman for Attorney General, and it was that was one of the reasons. And whether you voted for Maura Healy or Warren Tolman, we had two great candidates, and I think Maura Healy is going to be a great AG. Um, we're going to roll out some stuff on that. I think you can prevent a lot of it by making people aware of it. And a lot of this business isn't reinventing the wheel. You look at Amherst College, Kenyon, Kenyon, Kenyon State College, Montana State College, they get some great programs that are mandatory. All the kids have to go. And Warren was telling me a story about his son. Oh, I can't, at Amherst, I can't believe I got to do this, I got to go through this, Dad. At the end of it, he loved it. I mean, you, you teach him things about how a woman can't consent if she's drunk. You, you, you talk to them about different things, but we also know that there are predators, um, there's a small percentage who cause the majority of those campus sexual assaults. And if, if a woman's more likely to be raped on a college campus than mainstream society, we've got to do a whole lot more. 
and I hope to, I had our interns put something together. I'm hoping to get out to all the colleges. As you know, the colleges don't want to be telling families, well, we had this on our campus, so we had this. That's one of the problems. I'm not looking for more reporting requirements for the colleges, but I want to see if we can get some programs, get some more awareness. You know, it's just good government to deal with it. Yes. Uh, Joe. Yes. Uh, number one, I haven't seen you at Dunkin' Donuts. And number two, uh, with the heroin problems been out there, I think the city is doing a disservice and not reporting all the all the uh, all, all the overdoses that have been able to be have been uh, reversed by that. Um, now, Ken. Yeah, I think it's about fifty. They've already stopped. Okay. Um, I think they try a couple of problems. One with toxicology. We sat down with Charlie Baker yesterday. Uh, he came into the DA's meeting. We sat down with Martha Copley next month. Um, Baker got it, and I'm sure Copley gets it too. Um, the opiate problem oftentimes starts with a pill in your medicine cabinet. Uh, Charlie was over at Harvard Healthcare, and he talked about how you take a couple doses of a pill, it changes your body chemistry. And we all know friends, we all have friends who are alcoholics, it touches almost every family, or who will become drug dependent. Um, I think we've got to do more on that end. Um, we've had 40, 45 overdose deaths since July 1st in Worcester County. One of the problems is the resources aren't there at the medical examiner's office, at the State Police Crime Lab. Toxicology reports are taking three, four, five, six months to get back to us. We've got to do better. Um, if we walk in, a guy's got a needle in his arm and a rubber hose around, we get a pretty good idea what it was. The Narcan, I, I support Narcan completely, fully, and totally, and if any of you don't, I, I just want to tell you this story. I met Crompton Park one day watching my uh, oldest boy, JJ, who was playing basketball in the summer league, and I looked over, there were two fire engines, two ambulances, two police cars, and I, I walked over and I, I recognized one of the officers, Officer Roberge, I said, what do you got? He goes, Overdose. I said, Harlan? He goes, yeah. I go, no, I can't. He goes, watch this. This guy was a frequent flyer, meaning the police had seen him on many occasions. They knew him to be a heroin addict, lying down. Pulse was minimal. Um, the breathing was very shallow. He was almost gone. And uh, he popped up. Where am I? I said, well, Phil, you overdosed. I did? Yeah. Oh, boy. Phil, I think you can get up walk over to that ambulance? I'll give it a try. He got up, walked to the ambulance. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. Never seen anything like it. So we did, recently we did a, re, a training for all the police departments. We're going to do some more trainings. And I'm trying to get something online too. What the Narcan does, and, and I'm going to shorten it, um, the receptors, say this is a receptor for opiates in the brain, and they just come right in. The Narcan puts a seal over the receptor. The opiates can't get in. So as you're progressing through an overdose, you, you know, your body's becoming more and more relaxed, your breathing is shallow, your, your, your body's shutting down, it stops it, and the effects um, immediately stop. Now, if you don't give enough Narcan, the person's groggy, if you give too much, they're already going through the symptoms of withdrawal, maybe vomiting, uh, they may be a little bit violent, so you have to have trainings, and it has to be done the right way. Um, I, I'm hoping every police department gets Narcan. My philosophy is get them into a bed. My philosophy is not to be throwing the user in jail. And, and believe me, the jails aren't full of users. The, use, the jails are full of dealers. If we can get someone to deal with, the, with their problem, whether it be alcohol or drugs, whatever, you're just making it easy. You're saving the taxpayer money. You, 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 you're not going to need more and more jails. So I support Narcan use. I'd be happy to talk with anyone after this if you, if, if you need to, uh, if you disagree with me. Yes, Steve. Joe, what's your stand? Um, my stand on legal, I, I'm, I'm posing it, Steve, for a couple of reasons. If you talk to all the addiction people, uh, they tell you it's not a good idea, for kids especially. You know, we just changed it so you can't sentence a juvenile who commits a murder to life because their brain's still forming. I don't think we should be letting them use marijuana that's 70 times stronger than the marijuana that was around in the 70s. Um, I, I just, you know, you got to let the brain develop. I have a problem with legalizing it. I support it for medical use. I had a friend die of pancreatic cancer who couldn't to keep food down, probably would have ate it, 
smoked it, so we could eat if it were legal. I, I couldn't say to a kid who's suffering, or a guy who's suffering from glaucoma, you can't, you can't smoke marijuana, because they don't know why, um, but it takes the pressure off the eye. I, I support it for those reasons. The problem I had with the decriminalization was there was a paragraph at the very end, um, and George Soros put about $750,000 of his own money into this. Um, paragraph at the end that said, um, for these life-threatening purposes or any other medical purpose that a doctor deems necessary. Yeah, Sprained ankle, anxiety, headaches. That's where I have a problem with it. I, the people in Colorado will tell you that hospitalizations are up. Uh, you can't overdose on marijuana, but there's a psychological problem. There's paranoia. Um, they said it's been a disaster. The food that they're putting it into, gummy bears, uh, brownies, I don't think those are the messages we want to be sending to kids. And although, you know, they'll be the first ones to tell you, well, you're not going to have a guy come out, go out and commit ten violent murders on marijuana, he'll be eating brownies. Um, by the same token, I don't want him getting behind the wheel of a car because we see so many horrible accidents, there's so much carnage. I try and meet with all the families of people who have lost someone in a, in a car accident, and literally, life can change in the blink of an eye. So I, I oppose the legalization of it. I Look, no one, I didn't prosecute anyone for possession. I put them in my diversion program. You know, the kid, we're just trying to get them, uh, so when they come out and say the, the jail's full of nonviolent drug offenders, it's not true. It's not true. No one went to jail for straight possession. They'd be back five, six, seven times um, before anyone might go to jail. And it, and it wasn't for possession. It might be for dealing, things of that nature. I, okay. Do you want me to take one or two more questions, or you, or you give me the bum's rush? <laughs> come on. All right. Yes. Uh, back to Blackstone, although it's a bigger picture. The average citizen, what action would someone have taken if they suspected that there was something wrong in that household? How would they have gotten action taken a year ago, two years ago? Call the police. You know, you know I drove by that house almost every day. I never even saw it. Yeah. It's just tucked away. It's very close to the police department. I'm sure they never saw it. It's just back off of the street. All if you them. did, if you saw, uh, sorry, uh, smelled the horrible odor coming out of the house, call the police. Call the police. It's not a matter of calling the police. Jeez, you know, I want to remain anonymous, but could you just take a look at this house? Could someone go over and knock on the door? We do well, be the police do a great job. They do well-being checks all the time. That's the way you do it. Um, you, could, you could call DCF. Uh, the, the easiest thing to do is just call the police department and call my office. Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about the bullying program, the anti-bullying program? Absolutely. Anyone who has grandchildren or children in school, if you want this program, go on our website, contact our office. It's one of the most gut-wrenching things in this job, seeing kids get bullied. Mm -hmm. We try and make kids identify with it. We tell them if you got a younger brother or an older brother or a younger sister or older sister, if you wouldn't want it said about them, don't say it about someone else. The online stuff, I, I mean, I'm not very good on a computer, but the online stuff is just horrible. It's instant, it's instant, it's instant. We had a kid tell one of our experts he'd rather take a physical beating Imagine that. He'd rather get beaten up because a physical beating had a start point and an end point. But each day, each morning, he woke up and saw the bullying, saw what was said about him that day or the next day or the next day. It just drove him crazy. Anyone who wants to get us, we, we, I love going to the schools and doing the bullying program. Um, you know, as the kids use it, I think they become more detached. I think emotionally things change. If you were in a schoolyard, you know, I, and I tell them, you can gauge what I'm saying. You can gauge my facial expressions. You know when to stop. They tell us one of the biggest reasons they, they say things because they thought it was funny. They didn't think it'd have an effect. Um, but when you're online, you don't have that personal interaction, and that's the real problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you heard Sasha how great a club it was. Yes.